Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure to introduce Jose Bilbao, not only because Jose is such a great researcher, he's also such a great friend. So I assume that most of you know Jose. He's here in the last 10 years, something no, like that. Eight, yeah. Uh, he did his PhD with Alistair, was uh, one of the founders of the 464 group, and now he's Indeed. a uh, lecturer here, he also a team leader. The great with Jose is not that also he has like such a great knowledge in everything that he speaks about, like from Spanish knowledge and uh, Latin America and PVT, but also he know how to explain his knowledge, so he know how to teach, and he's doing that in such a passionate way, so you, you become excited about everything that he said. Oh, thank so you. I'm sure that it's going to be a great talk, so let's welcome Jose. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Ziv. That was the best introduction that I've ever had. Um, yeah, so the, the title of my um, presentation is 10 years of research on PVT systems at UNSW. And I thought I was able to cover everything that I want to cover, but when I realized that everything we've done in the last 10 years, I had to um, put things out. Uh, so the title is more ambitious probably of what we're going to see today, but Maybe that opens uh, the opportunity for further um, seminars. Um, today I'm going to present mostly of what I did during my PhD, it was finished in 2013, but also what all the people have done in our team. So I want to acknowledge first uh, Alistair, as Steve said, um, is the team leader of PVT Systems and we've been working for many years now on this. Uh, Shelley Bambrook, she finished in 2012 and then moved to Germany. Um, our current PhD students met at Simao, Jinji, and Jian Zhao. Uh, some of them are here today, and we're going to show you some of that work. Uh, special thanks to the Systems and Policy Group at SPRI. Um, thank you guys for supporting me and for uh, all these years of hard work. Uh, to the 464 group, as Steve said, without you guys, the PhD would have been harder. And also to Rob Largent. Uh, he's always behind the scenes, you know, working all the time, and you don't see the work except when it's uh, on the web. So thank you, Rob, for your hard, hard work all these years. Um, so what is PVT? Um, it's, it's a very simple technology, if you think about it. It's mixing PV uh, modules with solar collectors. And the idea is that you have only one uh, collector, what we call, uh, a PVT collector that can produce electricity and heat. Um, uh, basically speaking, we have two main type of PVT collectors. The PVT water collector that uh, uses water as the fluid, as the cooling fluid, and PVT air that uses air. Yeah? There are more types of collector, but these are the main general uh, types that we, we, we you can find in the literature. Now, why PVT? Why do we care about PVT? Why cool a module? Um, we know that solar cells have a maximum efficiency limit, and that for single junction cells, that's around 33%. I think for silicon, it's around 32%. If we go multi-junction, the theoretical limit is 49, and UNSW is doing very well to try to reach that limit. Um, so we know that at best, 50% of that energy of solar energy is going to end up as heat, right? Not only that, but we also know that that efficiency limit depends on temperature, right? And generally speaking, the efficiency of, the solar, of a solar cell decreases with temperature. Uh, you know, a higher temperature, we have a lower uh, solar cell efficiency, but we just saw that most of the time we're going to heat that module when it receives solar energy, so we, are on, we end up with a module that has lower efficiency because it's running hotter. So then it, may, it seems obvious that cooling a PV module is a good idea, right? And therefore, PVT is a good idea, right? The, behind, the main idea behind PVT is that we decrease the temperature of a cell or a module uh, by cooling it with a fluid and that increases the efficiency of the cell or the module, so we get more electricity. We can use that waste heat that we recover from the module, so we get heat, not only electricity, but also heat. 
and that, in theory, will produce profit, right? We get heat and electricity, everything is more efficiency, we're all happy. And in theory, yes, that's what's happened, but there is fine print, right? And I'm going to spend a bit of the time uh, on the presentation talking about those fine prints, right? And just to give you an idea, PVT is, is not new. Uh, it was, you know, first explored in the 1970s by uh, Dr. Wolf. And if you think about it, for something that's been discovered or re done research for 40 years, you don't see PVT everywhere. And that tells you a bit about that maybe that fine print is, is important, right? And of the challenges. So if you look at, at the literature, you will see that PVT has a lot of potential. Uh, we have high energy density, me meaning that a PVT uh, system, in theory, can provide more energy per square meter per area than a PV and a solar, ho solar hot water collector, you know, if you put them side by side. Uh, because of this, there is potential reduction cost. Um, in theory, we, we can reach very high combined efficiencies between 60 and 80 percent. We have, therefore, lower payback time and lower energy payback time. Um, and all this means that we could generate most of the energy required by a house. Um, we also have potential uses in commerce and industry. Now, this is all potential, right? And achieving this potential is what makes PVT tricky. And that's why we're doing research. Uh, one important point, architectural deformity. Um, some people don't care about it, but architects do and homeowners do. They would prefer to have only one type of solar module instead of a PV system and a solar hot water system that they look different. Um, this great graph is from Shelley, Shelley Bambrook. So um, she did uh, this work as part of her thesis and here we have what we call, um, it's a unit called 1 over NTU, but basically take it as a, um, references of the flow. So here we have a low flow rate of the fluid, cooling the PVT, and here we have a high flow rate of the fluid. Um, this is normalized efficiency, thermal efficiency, and this is a normalized temperature rise. And what Shelley did was great. She, she went to the literature. Uh, these are all the articles that she went through. And she was able to map the deficiency of those, um, of those research, of those articles in that curve. Now, what is important is that um, this graph tells us that if we want a high temperature rise of that fluid, so if we want to extract uh, hot water, for example, the efficiency, the thermal efficiency of your system is going to be low, right? So in reality, what we want is to have a low temperature rise so we can have a good thermal efficiency that provides good cooling and that provides, you know, a better efficiency for our cells. But then how useful is low temperature? How useful is having a 30 degree hot water shower or 20 degree hot water shower? No one will like that, right? So you can, you can see how then we, PVT start to have these trade-offs. On one side we have heat and the other water. If we want more electricity, sorry, heat and electricity. If we want more electricity, we're going to have less heat. If we want more heat, we're going to have less electricity. Not only that, but we also have this trade-off between efficiency and temperature rise, or exergy. So if we want a bigger temperature rise, we're going to have less efficiency. If we want more efficiency, we're going to have a lower temperature rise. Now, in the literature, there's been a lot of discussion on exergy, and some researchers have proposed exergy as a way to optimize a PVT system. Because the higher the temperature rise, in theory, you have more exergy, and in theory, then you have a more useful uh, heat output. Um, Alistair and I have a different opinion on that, and we believe that exergy just tends to optimize your system um, in a non-optimal way, if you want. It tends to write your system hotter, and really what you want to do in PVT is look at your application and the temperature required for your application. So at the beginning of my PhD, I was 
really thinking hard about this trade-off, how to deal with them, right? And it was a bit disturbing, so I got a bit upset at the beginning. Uh, you know, one day in the lab, I was with, you know, trying to cool this cell, and it wasn't a great day. I think Alistair took that photo, but <laughs> anyway, when I come down, I actually got an idea. And the idea was to try to find a middle ground. And that actually resulted in a PBT water system for developing countries, which was um, trying to achieve a system that could provide water, warm water and electricity um, you know, to, to a house in a developing country. And I say warm water because actually one of the, one of the goals was to try to keep the, the cells cool, right, and to gain that efficiency. So I developed a criteria that it has to be low cost, it had to, be, it had to use available materials, uh, it had to be able to be manufactured on site, and it had to have a, a reasonable performance. Also, we didn't have a budget, so we had to comply with those criteria anyway, right? Um, so I think we spent around 200 bucks in, in the whole system. Um, although we did require important equipment, uh, and that was good weather data, including a sky temperature, something that no one has done before around here. Um, and it's important, and we're going to talk about that later. So I want to show you a bit of the manufacturing steps. First was selecting a module. Uh, we use a frameless module, and we went to Bay Street and got one of those ones. I think Nick Shaw helped me on that. And then I probably spent half of my PhD trying to remove this junction box. Don't do it at home. <laughs> um, but I did it. I managed. Um, and once I be, was able to remove that junction box, I actually um, you know, bond the water channels that uh, I, bo I bought them from um, Bannings. It's just a roofing system uh, that you can put on your house. It's a polycarbonate with channels, right? And it was perfect for my system. Um, so I bonded using <laughs> silicon. And I managed to uh, have thermocouples connected between the um, PV module and the collector because I wanted to measure the, what we call the plate temperature. Um, this here you can see kind of like the final product. You can see how that the polycarbonate channels, um, they were roughly like one centimeter by one centimeter. And this is the PV module. And the idea was then that the water would flow through those channels. After that, I installed back insulation, and uh, I put the junction, book, uh, jun junction box back. Um, the insulation is important in PVT systems because you want to trap the heat, right? PV modules have been designed to lose heat, and PVT, you actually want to keep the heat to be able to use it. So I install a new frame, again, very simple aluminum uh, frame, and then I mount the collector on the top of the electrical engineering roof where we were based, you know, seven years ago or whatever it was this. Um, then I have to mount the header pipe. You can see there probably just the, um, the polycarbonate channels and that's a close up. Um, I have to find a way to seal the pipe within channels because I didn't want water running everywhere. Um, I didn't use any fancy material or technique. I just used a lot of silicone. And it worked <laughs> for the duration of my PhD, at least. Um, and that's, th that's the finished system. Uh, you can see there is very low cost. Uh, we use a water tank. Again, I bought it in Bunnings, 100 liters of water. Uh, inside the tank, there is a sub submersible pond pump that was 20 watt and probably too big for this. Um, even a two watt or three watt pump would have done, but I couldn't find any of those. Um, I, of course, installed thermocouples, inlet, outlet, um, flow sensors, paranometers, etc. And I also installed uh, the same, the, a, se a module, a PV module, um, you know, for the same model, uh, just as a control. Right? So we could compare the PVT and the PV module. And by the way, these modules were around 12% efficiency. 
And that's important, and we're going to see why in the future. The system works 24 7, and the idea is that the system will work during the day, heating the water, but at night it will cool the water. Right? And the idea is that I wanted the water to be cool in the morning so there was enough difference in temperature so it could be heated again. Right? So that way I didn't have to do anything with the system, I just leave it, leave it running for months without any problems. Uh, and it worked quite well, but also allows us to have data during day and during night. I'm going to show you also why that is important. So some experimental data. Um, the red, the darker red is the PV panel and the light red is the PVT panel. As you can see, the PVT system outperformed the PV module because we were cooling it. Um, so it was running, the normal PV module in summer it was running about 50, 60 degrees and the PVT was running about 40 degrees, right? So it wasn't super cool, but it was cool enough to pr produce a difference. And 40 degree waters was a good outcome because you can actually use that for showering or something like that. So from the point of view of this idea to build something for a developing country, you know, it was kind of possible. Uh, the only difference was in July when I ran an stagnation experiment. Stagnation means when you stop uh, the fluid, when there is no fluid. And this is one of the problems and one of the most tricky problems with PVT systems. If there is no water cooling the system, then because you have insulation and all these things, your system runs hotter than a normal PV panel. And in July, you can see that the PV panel actually outperformed the PVT. Right. Now, to be honest, it wasn't really an experiment. The pump failed during July. And I found out like a month later, but it was good at the end. Um, I had data that I didn't um, thought I would have, so uh, it turned out okay. And sorry, that was that should say heat. So what do we do with no more heat is needed? And that's one of the questions with PVT, and it's not solved today, and is one of the most um, you know important areas of research. Uh, another important thing, um, you know, this is just a comparison between our thermal and our electrical output. You can see that we have a lot of more heat output than electricity, right? And that makes sense. If you think about it, this is a 12% efficient cell. Everything else, you know, or almost all of it is going to be captured by heat. So then the other question is, <coughs> is this a right generation profile for any application? And the answer is no. If we produce more heat than electricity, then we should use PVT for an application that requires more heat than electricity, right? And that's not the case of a house, for example. Um, I also ran the PVT only as a solar collector during the last month, uh, and that was only mostly for um, module uh, for the model tuning. So I want to make sure that my model was performing correctly. And speaking of models, uh, this is one of the models that, uh, models that I created. It's a transient model based on an RC network. Um, this is just a diagram, but the model was actually implemented in MicroCAP. Uh, so I was running simulation in MicroCAP, MicroCAP and I got very good results. So that black line there is the error that you can see is pretty minimal in this case between the outlet temperature model versus the estimated. So the, um, the model was doing really, really, really well. And a lot of the reasons why is because we had good data, good experimental data, including the sky temperature. Um, probably you can see, you can't see that, but the uh, radiation losses on the top of your panel go to the sky, right? And that's why having the sky temperature is important. Um, this is thermal energy. Again, the results are very good. There is some more difference compared to the uh, outlet temperature, and that's because flow rate also plays uh, an important part on calculating the thermal, uh, thermal output. And um, flow rate wasn't as um, constant as I, I would have liked. But anyway, the results are still quite good. And you can see here how during the day, the system is absorbing heat. 
and at night the system is actually losing heat, right? releasing heat to the, uh, to the environment. So actually this idea of resetting the experiment every day worked quite well. Finally, uh, comparison of experimental data with the model on electricity output. Um, and again, it was quite good. My main problem here was the actual, you can see all those blue dots. That's not the model data, that's experimental data. And that's because the MPPT wasn't working as I expected all the time. So, um, you know, that's experimental error uh, from reality. Uh, but in, in theory, the model, the, the PV system should have been performed like, like the model suggested. Anyway, as I mentioned, the transient model was hard to use because it was developed in microcap, and microcap is not designed to run simulations for um, year-long data, for example. Um, so I developed a steady-state model uh, in transis using Fortran, and I model the model included an, um, one iteration plus uh, an empirical relation from Actor and Mulik to estimate the cover temperature. If you don't use something like that, you have to do a double iteration that takes a long more time. But I did some checks, and th actually that empirical relation, uh, it was very close to, to, to reality. So I compare both model against experimental data. And we have the steady model here and the, uh, the RC model here, the dynamic model there. And you can see I, I use minute data uh, because I want to make sure that um, you know, I had my models were good enough to capture all the minimal variations that you can get even with clouds and everything. And you can see that the mean bias errors were very small, the R squares were very high, uh, and in general the models were performing really, really good, which I was happy, and that allowed me to, you know, move on and create simulations to see how we could use the system. Important, the RC model took a long time to finish compared to the steady state model. So from now on, I everything I'm going to show you is from the steady state model. Um, the steady state model wasn't as good as the RC model, but good enough. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I talked to you about sky and how sky was important to calculate your heat losses. And uh, this, is, this is from a, a, a paper in a conference, and we show how models that don't take into account a sky in a correct way can, uh, un can uh, undersize or underestimate the heat losses quite a lot, from 10 to almost 30 percent, right? And these things that th this means that they will uh, show you results that are not true, because if your heat losses are lower, means that you are going to recover more heat, which is not what happens in reality. So that was an, a nice contribution. And um, I show that sky temperature is particularly important for PVT system because the high emissivity of the surfaces. Um, uh, glass is high, it has high emissivity, and solar cells have high emissivity. And this is not what happens usually in solar hot water collectors when your absorber plate, for example, has low emissivity. So you reduce your radiation losses. So I wanted to check how the system performed, uh, for example, for a domestic hot water. Uh, so I did an optimization based on different control types. Um, you know, how good was going to be the thermal conductance of heat between um, the cells and the fluid, and also between different flow rates. And you can see that their optimums depends on for each case. Now, the differences are not that much. You know, I have to zoom in that uh, this graph so, so you can see the difference. So even though there is an optimum, the differences are not that, uh, that big enough. So I run this for Sydney, um, and you can um, have a look at the results there. Something I probably didn't mention before is that we have covered and uncovered PVT systems. So the cover has an additional glass cover on top of the PVT, on top of the PV. So that means that you have actually two glass panes, right? And that's reduce, that reduces the, uh, um, the op increases the optical losses because you have more glass, but increases the thermal gains. And that's what you can see here. Um, the covered system 
produces more thermal energy and less electricity, which is what we were expecting. And the uncovered system produces, um, you know, more electricity and less thermal energy. Now, if you remember a couple of slides ago, I show you how my system produces a lot more thermal energy than electrical energy. And this is the other way around. And the difference is because this is a real system looking to heat water to 80 degrees, right? That means that there is an electrical booster and the way the system works at the end means that we can't use all the heat coming from those panels because it's not, you know, the temperature is not there for the uncovered system. So this means that the PVT in this case is mostly um, running in a stagnation. It's not working, you know? Only in particular times during summer, when we covered, we are able to recover more energy or more heat. So then we have more fluid going, we can recover more heat. So, yes, um, I, I make some, you know, configurations between series and parallel. You can see that um, in series, we ob obtain some more thermal energy than in parallel when we, we, we connect them uh, in the fluid, so we have one um, solar collector after the other, it means that we increase the temperature as we go. Uh, so there is a difference, but the effects are small. The, as I mentioned, the cover system provides a higher combined output um, than the uncovered system. And this shows that PVT works, but it really depends on the application. And Although this shows results and that it could be installed, it doesn't mean that it's the most efficient application for this. And I just, you know, mentioned some of the problems and stagnation is one of the big ones. So we start looking for other applications and one of them is sky cooling. So you can see here, for example, how the ambient temperature is higher than the average sky temperature. Yeah, and that's very typical. That's actually measured data um, of night radiated cooling that we achieved with our PVT system here uh, when it was installed in electrical engineering. I was able to model then our, um, our system for a year and simulate the data using the model that uh, I showed you uh, it was giving good results. So the idea was to actually understand how much of the losses were radiative losses and then convective losses. And the blue ones are convective losses, the red, red ones are radiation losses. So we can see that a lot of the losses are due to radiation and what then we call sky cooling. So with, we, we then realize that there is a potential of sky cooling and I run a simulation for several uh, places. Uh, Sydney is the blue one. You can see how cooling effect increases in winter because it's colder, of course, but also because we have clear skies during winter than we have during summer. I use Singapore, and you can see how the cooling potential in Singapore is flat during the whole year. Right? And that's because temperature is roughly normal, but also because uh, the cloud cover is roughly the same. In Tucson, uh, it's kind of like a desert climate. Um, you can see that we have very good cooling most of the time because we have clear skies, except when they have a season of a mini monsoon during July and August, and then again we have good solar, good night cooling. Finally, Hamburg, um, the system actually produces almost the same cooling that Sydney, just on the northern hemisphere. Now, I, I don't know if you need cooling in Hamburg, but if if it is required, you can obtain it with a PVT system. So in conclusions, you know, uncovered PVT systems can be used for uh, rad night radiative cooling. Um, it has to be uncovered because if you cover it, then you reduce your, you know, your losses. Um, the cooling potential goes from 400 watt hours per square meter to 900 watt hours per, uh, per square meter per night. And you know, it's possible to provide cooling through the whole year, although it really depends on temperatures and, um, you know, the cloud cover. Also, um, the percentage of radiative and convective cooling depends on many variables, but, you know, it's 
we can see here in the graph that most of the time you have more radiative cooling is around 60 to uh, 80 percent. Now I want to show you what we're doing at the present and this is mostly work from our um, our students. We have a new and updated PVT hot water setup here up in Tyree. So these are uh, commercial PVT collectors provided by Solimpics, one of our industry partners. We have a new um, weather station that is measuring everything. Um, so GNG is using these uh, new modules to create uh, and to optimize, um, you know, new systems and uh, PVT models. We also, this is all part of a new PVT air roof. So um, that's a new roof that uh, I just took this this morning. So it's fresh. This is the, um, it's like a new hat over our existing uh, monitoring room. And these are uh, a blue scope <coughs> product that has channels in there. So we can run air under those channels. Um, and what we need to do now is install some PV modules on top of those, on, on top of that steel. Uh, we are thinking how we're going to do that, but it's part of the project. Uh, and this is a CRC project, by the way. Uh, just some photos of, of the system and uh, how it was on the construction. Now, the point of this new PVT air system is actually to use it as a desiccant solar cooling system. So we're going to um, provide heating during winter directly, and we're going to provide cooling in summer using a desiccant wheel and a, a evaporative cooler. Some of this work was presented in, um, in Asia Pacific Solar Research Conference. Um, I'm not going to bore you with details, but basically it says that we can take warm and humid air, um, cool it and you know, get it into nice, pleasant, um, dehumidified and you know, cool air. So we have more result, results on this coming soon, uh, hopefully a paper. Um, and it's looking very good. It's promising results so far. Uh, and we believe that Sydney, for example, will be a great uh, climate in which we could use a system like this um, and reduce the use of normal HVAC systems uh, instead of PVT air desiccant cooling. Now, the important here uh, or the trick is that we are using ground couple heat exchangers. Um, in our case, that could be bore water that is going to pre-cool the air before it goes into the system and then uh, cool it again when it goes just before the, um, into, into the space that we want to cool. So PV systems seem like a good idea. In theory, they have high energy density, they have high efficiencies potentially, and they're actually a cogeneration or even a three generation system if we can, right? We provide heating, cooling, and electricity. But they're complex. You need, you know, you need plumbers, you need electricians, you need designs. Uh, so you need a lot of uh, standards, uh, standards that actually don't exist at the moment. It needs to be tailored for either application. So it's not like PV that you can basically uh, grid connect the systems, design them very quickly. Um, this needs to be, because it's a core generation, you need to make sure that you are measuring your electricity loads and your thermal loads and you are matching them correctly. Um, and you know, at the moment there is no great penetration, penetration on the market, even though the first panel was, uh, you know, uh, investigated in the 70s as we mentioned. So currently PVT systems are expensive and rare, but that might change. And that might change maybe in the future, um, thanks to BIPV, T system, but also maybe to high efficiency cells. And I'm going to spend the next five minutes hopefully explaining you this. So uh, in 2015 in PV6, uh, uh, PVSEC in Busan, I wanted to show hypothetically how um, future cell efficiencies are correlated to temperature coefficients. So I went through, you know, literature and the web and found out these um, this relationship between different type of solar cells. In the same conference, uh, Panasonic um, mentioned a new champion cell that 
kind of falls in these categories, which I was happy with, right? So it shows that roughly we could use that, uh, that relationship between temperature coefficients and efficiency. So I went and I choose three candidates, you know, between 20, 30, and 40 percent. And using that relationship, I got these temperature coefficients. Now you can see how the higher the efficiency of the cell, the lower the temperature coefficient. And that has some interesting results. So these are the efficiencies that I simulated using the models that I had. Um, you can see the electrical efficiency increases with cell efficiency, which is obvious. Nothing, uh, nothing surprising about that. Uh, the thermal efficiency decreases. Again, nothing surprised because most of the energy now is converted to electricity. But uh, maybe a bit surprisingly, the total efficiency increases slightly. Right? And that's because more of the energy is being converted to electricity, which means that uh, our systems are going to be more efficient. So if we go back to a similar scenario as before with our domestic hot water system, we have a similar result that between covered and uncovered systems, the covered system provides you know, more energy because mainly we can provide more thermal energy. But interestingly, the different efficiencies and the fact that we can have cover and cover systems give us a lot of alternatives to maybe tune the uh, PVT system design depending on the application. So for example, if we see here, half of the energy is thermal and half of the energy is PV, and here most of the energy is PV and then little energy is thermal which is maybe similar to what you will have in a house application, where most of your appliances are electrical, but you only use heat for hot water tanks and things like that. Now, if I just remove the thermal energy, you can see that um, there is almost no uh, performance penalty between having cover or not cover, right? And that's because of the low temperature coefficient of the new cells. So if we talk about the future, we can say that increasing cell efficiencies will result in lower temperature coefficients. And that makes cooling the solar cells less um, interesting because you're not going to gain as much energy, right? But if you look at it from the other way, it also means that you are going to have less penalty by running your solar cells a bit hotter, right? And that means that then you can have a balance between the thermal and electrical that is tunable. And it's, it's starting to reduce that trade-off that we saw at the beginning between uh, hotter systems and cooler systems and efficiency and exergy. So low cost of PV could open the door for you know, using PVT modules in higher application systems, and especially via PVT, which is where we are seeing uh, PVT gaining more ground, especially in Europe, um, where PVT systems have been incorporated in buildings as part of facades or roofs to try to help the system uh, relate with the environment through the facade, right? Uh, and that way you can use this heat to either cool or heat. Um, so we believe that BIPVT is, you know, there's going to be a lot of work in there in the future. And currently the IEA is working on defining a new PVT task. Uh, you can, you can see the link, um, and it's related to solar heating and cooling uh, applications. And I think, yep, that's all for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Mark. Um, with your first experiments, when you're doing water temperature, What's the risk around growing things in the tank and making it not great for the people who are using it for anyway? Yep, it's high. So um, one of the one of the put options to do that is to raise the temperature water to 60 degrees once a week, and make sure that you kill Legionella or anything else, um, but you don't have to keep it, you know, hot all the time. That can be done here, by the way. If you look at the standard uh, in Australia 
you only have to raise the temperature once a week um, for a certain amount of time. So if you do it 60 degrees, it's a couple of hours. If you go to 90 degrees, it's you know, 15 minutes. But yeah, good question. Matthias? I was wondering about the radiative cooling. Um, yep. how, how much hotter do the panels get <coughs> if you stop the radiative cooling? Or how, much, like how much hotter can you get the water? Well, in theory, you can go to 80 degrees, right? So normal solar hot water collectors that stop with the radiative cooling with a cover and also by having a low emissivity absorber, they can go to 100 degrees. They can actually boil water. Have you thought about trying to put something like that on one of your PVT systems? Well, you can't. No, because you have the cells. So the cells are your absorber. So you can't reduce the emissivity of your cells. Maybe. But isn't it different wavelength? Um, yes, it's different wavelength, but it means that you will have to put something on top of it, yeah. right? Now, the problem is, is stagnation. What happens if your temperature goes to 100 degrees in your solar collector, in your PVT? You know, I I had the 100 degrees EVA start to, you know, become unstable and everything. So, you know, wouldn't be ideal. And, and that's the problem, it's how to deal with this stagnation. So people have come with ideas of maybe have um, a glass that can change color if it gets too hot, right? To stop uh, solar radiation coming in and then it, that, will, that will keep your cells at a, at a better temperature, things like that. But um, what we're doing is try to use that heat for cooling applications, which probably makes more sense. Yes, Paran. Thanks for the, for the great presentation. Um, I want to ask about the heating aspect of the PVT. Um, you mentioned PV are, systems are becoming even more cheaper. Do you think using PV as the electrical source for directly heating the water um, can potentially prevent the uptake of PVT? Uh, it will only depends on the cost. Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and we've seen problems with that. Now, um, some people is doing it. I don't, I don't know if it makes sense. I mean, if you're going to use electricity to heat water, it's good to use a heat pump anyway, right? Because that way, um, that electricity, one unit of electricity will provide you two or three or four uh, units of heat, which is the more efe efficient way to do it. Uh, and then you can use the rest of electricity for appliances that, you know, can't use heat. So, but yeah, it's, it, it, at the end it's, it's going to be all about cost. Um, at least in Australia, PVT systems are expensive, but also solar hot water collectors. Um, so the industry as a whole, there is a danger to be overcome by low PV systems, definitely. Mark. Can you, the problem with this, am I using the air or not issue, can you just use the expansion of the air to drive a turbine? So, um, some it's a possibility. So, if you have this in a facade, right, and you have the whole facade of the building, then maybe it will be potentially able to produce enough, uh, you know, points and, and, and r heat rise from the air to move some, um, you know, turbines on the top. But and that's part of the. BIPVT systems that we think are going to start appearing. But again, it's complex, right? It's not a simple system. You need to design it from the beginning. You need to have the turbine that increases maintenance. So this heating air, is, you've just got to wait pressure on the air. Yeah. yeah. So then you can drive some So PVT air systems for that reason are simpler than PVT water because you can always get rid of, rid of the air in a more economic way and that you can't do with water. I guess you know one consequence of going to the higher temperatures like you were talking about in the later part of the talk is that you know there's a rule of thumb every 10 degrees centigrade rise you accelerate any degradation process by a factor of two and uh, there's a lot of good data coming out now on, on thermal and um, moisture testing of, of standard panels and that kind yeah. of thing and uh, I've checked it against that formula and it comes out pretty close so um, 
I think you probably have to take that into account Absolutely. in your economics when you're looking at the life cycle yeah. costs. Yeah. No, definitely. And that also comes into... Um, so most of the problems with PVT system is that we are using a standard modules, right? But ideally you want to design your module from the bottom up to create specially designed PVT systems. And then we could tackle tho those degradation problems, maybe by using different materials. Um, yeah, definitely. That, that uh, lasts twice as long as if, if you go <laughs> 10 degrees lower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe the flip side too is that uh, PVT collectors employed for low temperature applications. So, I mean, I would think that, Jose didn't mention it, but PVT for swimming pool heating uh, is pretty is a pretty good application and, and would extend the life of the PV yep. and given the current cost of gas in Australia um, that's an area that we'd like to explore. Yeah so PVT for swimming pools is, is great um, and there is a there's one of the best applications because you have low temperature heat required for that and a lot of it. I'm going to ask another one. Um, Supriya and I have been looking at um, radiative cooling through the through the atmospheric window, the 8 to 13 micron band. So I think someone mentioned, you know, the yep. radiative cooling's wavelength uh, dependent. But there's been some quite good work uh, done at UTS and yeah. um, at Stanford on that, but looking at um, controlling the spectral emissivity of, of, of uh, you know, roofing material, for example, to allow it to cool below ambient in, in direct sunlight and, and that kind of thing. So there's probably a potential for, for if you're not already doing it, looking at the spectral uh, emissivity of these systems to control, yep. you know, your radiative cooling. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, you know, cloudy nights, you, your sky temperature's pretty clear what it is, but on a, yeah. a clear night, you, it's going to be very spectrally dependent. Yeah. So what we've done is actually without any optimization of the emissivity, and, and we can still observe some cooling, but if we optimize it, de definitely. It, it turns out that the type of glass that's used in panels is just about perfect for uh, cooling through that radiated yep. window. The, the glass has a um, the glass becomes very absorptive at, at um, close to um, eight microns. But if you manipulate the you know so it's reflective and shorter wavelengths beyond what the panel can respond to. So you want it absorptive at the at the at the optical wavelengths, and then you want it reflective out to eight microns, and then absorptive again past then you can um, you know you can reduce the operating temperature of the panel or vice versa if you do things the other way around I guess. Yep, great point. We need to finish because there is class after us, so let's say thanks for the again. Thank you.